Hey guys, in section 7.5 we're going to learn a little bit about the Galilean moons of Jupiter. So here they are, in their order uh, f from Jupiter, an increasing distance from Jupiter. So the closest Galilean moon to Jupiter is Io. Um, Io is quite something. It's the most volcanic object in the solar system. Slightly smaller and slightly further away is Europa. Europa is covered in a layer of ice. Underneath that icy surface, there's almost certainly uh, an ocean. Nobody knows quite how deep, but there's liquid water at any rate. And then underneath that ocean is a rocky core. Ganymede is the largest moon in the solar system. Uh, probably also has a subsurface ocean. And then finally, Callisto is the furthest out and uh, nearly as big as, as Ganymede. To give you a sense of scale, here are all four of the Galilean moons with our moon and with the Earth to give a sense of scale. And so here you can see that Io and the moon are just about the same size. What's interesting is the distance between the center of the moon and the center of the Earth is almost exactly the same as the distance between the center of Io and the center of Jupiter. Europa is a bit smaller. Ganymede, again, is larger than the, moon, than the planet Mercury, and so it's much larger than the moon, and then Callisto is also much larger than the moon. Oops. Io is quite something. It's got this incredible color because its surface is covered in different kinds of sulfur. The oranges and blacks and whites and yellows are all called allotropes of sulfur. That means atoms of sulfur that have bonded to each other in different ways, and that gives different colors. What's happening on Io, of course, is that Jupiter's tremendous gravitational field is squeezing Io. This is exactly what's happening between the Earth and the Moon. It's the reason we have tides on, on Earth, for example. But the effect is much larger on Io, and the effect of all of that squeezing is to create something called tidal heating. Basically, energy is being added to, to the moon as it's squeezed, almost like a tennis ball or a racquetball. And that energy escapes uh, through volcanoes. There's something like 400 active volcanoes at any given time on Io. For that reason, its surface is constantly being reshaped. And NASA has lots of pictures of parts or bits of Io's surface that have been reshaped in a few months or a few years. One of the other interesting things, I can play this GIF file for you, is that if you look at this, you'll notice that Europa is the one that's zipping around, pardon me, Io is zipping around the fastest. Europa is a little further away, and so it's moving a little more slowly. And then Ganymede is furthest away and moving the, the most slowly. But there's a resonance there, and what that means is that for every two times that Europa goes around Jupiter, pardon me, I keep making that mistake, for every two times that Io goes around Jupiter, Europa orbits once. Well, let's count it. There. So first orbit, second orbit, and you'll notice that in two Io orbits, Europa goes around twice. There. Right. You can also follow this for Io and Ganymede. Let's follow Io. And you'll notice that your Io has to go around four times to Ganymede's one. Start. Whoops, I'm sorry. Goofed it up here. Third revolution, fourth revolution, and bam, they lined up. Right. That's called a resonance. And one of the things that resonance does is it makes their orbits very stable. The other thing is it adds a bit of energy to their orbits, and that also contributes to Io's heating. Here's another GIF of a volcano on Io actually erupting. Uh, that's really quite something to see. Since Io has so little gravity, these eruptions blast material a couple of hundred miles into space. If that were to happen on Earth, uh, the, the space station and, and, and satellites in low Earth orbit would actually get what? They would get hit with debris, volcanic debris. That obviously doesn't happen on Earth because we have a, a much stronger gravity field. Here's Europa. What a stunning picture. Let's look at that. All of that detail there is just 
the colors. And the thing you'll notice is there are almost no impact craters, right? And that is, that is characteristic for Europa, that lack of impact craters, because Europa's icy surface uh, gets resurfaced fairly often. Let's see if I can get that about the right size again. Uh, maybe I can't do it. And, ooh, Jeepers came a steady there. And so it's really just a remark. You could get lost just following all those lines and bumps and crevasses. But here's what's happening, and it's really quite exciting. Here's the surface, the icy surface. Here's the ocean that's underneath. Here's the rocky core that is generating heat, yeah? Because Europa is getting squeezed just like Iowa does. Europa has tidal heating just like Iowa does. But because Europa is further away, it doesn't have as much heating. If this heating wasn't happening, this ocean would freeze solid. But because of the heating, this layer of ice is melted, right? And so what we have down here are these... Uh, you, down here, you can see there's energy there, right? Uh, if you're interested in this kind of thing, you can look up black smokers. Uh, deep in Earth's oceans, you'll find these thermal vents where you've got hot, hot water coming out. And just a few feet away, the temperature of the water is icy, icy cold. But in that couple of feet on Earth, there's actually an ecosystem, a pretty remarkable ecosystem. And so people say, if it works on Earth, why can't it work on Europa? Uh, this is not at the bottom of the ocean. This picture here, this big picture, is happening up at the top of the ocean. Water is being blasted through cracks or crevasses in the icy surface, and all of these wonderful molecules get blasted into space. The problem is that Europa doesn't have a magnetic field. It doesn't have an ionosphere. Europa has nothing that would block radiation from the sun, right? Charged particle radiation. And what that radiation does is break apart molecules. Um, and I, I think the suggestion here is that the colors, some of the reddishness, might be coming from molecules that were blasted out of the ocean and then broken down by radiation. Ganymede is just a big icy snowball, although there is some evidence that it also has an underwater ocean, or pardon me, a subsurface ocean. Uh, you can see that Ganymede is the biggest and the most massive of all of these. One thing that's interesting here, Europa has an ocean. Ganymede probably has an ocean. Even Callisto might have an ocean. There's a lot of ice on all three of these. But the one thing you will not find on Io is water. Io is about as dry an environment as you'll ever find. You can also see that these four moons make up almost all the mass. Jupiter has, what, 79 moons? But it's almost all these four. And finally, Callisto. You'll notice that Callisto is, uh, it looks like a big old snowball that's just got a lot of shot with BBs or something. It's one of the oldest, most ancient terrains ever observed in the solar system. Craters, of, craters on top of craters. It really has never been resurfaced, even in geologic time. But if people ever live in the Jovian system, they'll probably be living here because Callisto is far enough away from Jupiter that uh, the radiation from Jupiter wouldn't be a big issue. Living on Callisto uh, might be a little bit like living on the moon. There's a lot less gravity here than there would be on Earth. Um, but if that's an acceptable risk, Maybe someday people will live on Callisto.